All right. So good. You may be seated for a moment. Buenos dias. Feliz Dia de las Madres. Happy Mother's Day. Got to start learning some Spanish words, guys, because in heaven, guess what the heavenly language is? <laughs> en español. There's two things. You, Aleluya and amen. It's universal. So easy. I'm so happy to be here on this day, so happy to be in the house. It's a great, great honor to be here. I, I want to say happy Mother's Day to Mama. Uh, you accepted me from day one, and I love you. I Look at the great man you created for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. My mommy's in heaven, so is Grandma Edwards. And I don't even have to say uh, happy Mother's Day to them because they're happy. They're just resting. Waiting for that final day. Cuando nos iremos al cielo. Gloria a Dios. I'm going I'm to, I always imagine, like, when the Lord comes, if I'm still here, like, I want to be close to the cemetery. You know what I mean? Because then I'm, the, the, the graves are going to open up and the dead in Christ will rise. Can you imagine the sight? I'll be like, Mommy, I'll see you in a second. It's going to be so great. And everything that I am, everything that I learned, I learned it from my mommy. I learned to love Jesus. I learned to love my husband. I learned to love my kids. I learned to love the house of the Lord. I learned to love people because of who she was, who she was in my life. She poured into me, poured into us. And I am so grateful that the Lord gave her to me for 44 years, so grateful. And um, I, today I, there's a message in my heart that was poured into me a few months ago. And I'm so grateful that my husband, when I told him I had a word, and I never thought that he would say, you know, to bring it on this day, I thought we'll just do it at the women's, you know, the women's group. But I, um, I don't think I've ever said these things in, in, in public about him. But I'm so grateful to the Lord. You know, people, when he started announcing that I was going to preach, people were like, what are you going to say about your husband? You have to bring stories about your husband because he always talks about you from the pulpit. Well, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> when he talks about me eating, it's the truth. I love to eat. I think if anything scares him about me, it's my eating, my eating habits. Sometimes I hide in the kitchen when he's busy in his office, and I'm still crunching stuff over there. <clears throat> you know, open up a Pepsi. <laughs> I'm pretending I'm washing dishes and I'm eating all the leftovers. I'm horrible. But somebody said, you got to pick on him. You got to say something about him. They just want to know stuff about you, baby. So I was like, no, I, I can't. I can't. I don't know what story I would give. But then somebody came to me and said, I'll bring you 10 pounds of carne asada. If you talk about him. So guess who won? But, but you know, I, I will put all my notes away if my husband gives me more. Do you give more? <laughs> if not, I, I wrote a few things down about him. Not very many. But, you know, pastor, he's a little OCD. He's a little <laughs> Doesn't like the grandkids running around. <laughs> Doesn't like clutter. <laughs> He's amazing. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I just, um, I don't think I've ever said it in public, but I want to thank you. I want to thank you for believing in me, for encouraging me, for just being the man that you are. I love that you're the priest of our house. You know, my mom used to say to my sisters and I, don't ever be afraid to submit. Don't be afraid to submit to your husband. It's in the Bible. M women, don't be afraid of the word submissive. Because if your husband submits to the Lord, it's so easy. It's so easy to be under his control. And I don't want that role. I don't want the role of carrying our family, our, our household. You know why? Because I'm not going to be accountable for it. He is. He's going to be accountable for it. He's going to be accountable to how he leads our home. And I see the other side of what you guys don't see. I see him. Th this is who he is. What you see up here, that's what you see. That's what you get. He's very transparent. And he's just the real deal. I remember looking at my daughter about two weeks after when we got back from honeymoon. I was like, Liana, he is what he says he is. 
<laughs> he's real. He's the real deal. His passion, your passion for the word, for Jesus, for the house is contagious. I admire it. I love it. And I tell my mom every day, mommy, you would be so proud because I married a man of God. Somebody, he, she would just love you so much. And I know she's so proud of both of us. So thank you for carrying us through. It's it's nothing, there's nothing better than being a wife who feels protected and safe at home. Nothing. I am now living it. I didn't le live it in my first marriage. I, I had a hard time in my marriage, I, in my first marriage. But now after all that I went through and living now and what I used to see in my parents, I thank the Lord. And I, I tell him all the time, if I had to go through all of that to now get rewarded with a man like this, I will do it again. I would do it again. It's just amazing. Our life is amazing. We laugh every day. We, uh, it's just an amazing, amazing life. And, and let me tell you, I wasn't out looking. I didn't go out looking for him. I wasn't even coming to this church. I was going to a Hispanic church, all Spanish-speaking. So forgive my, sometimes, you know, my Mexicanist comes out, and I don't pronounce words right. Tell you right now. But, um. I came here because Juan and Brenda invited me one day and, uh, to come to the service. And when we met out the, outside the door, the Lord told me this was going to be my husband. And, it, and I know it was the Lord if you want to ask how I knew it. Because I know my shepherd's voice. I know his voice. And he told me this was the man for me. This was going to be my husband. And I walked out the parking lot and I told them, he's going to marry me. Se va a casar conmigo, le dije Sergio. I like knew, and next time he goes to India, I'm going to be going with him. I'm, and I'm laughing like a school, like a school girl, laughing because I, what, India? And guess what, the next year I was in India, weren't we? Oh, getting sick together with that food. Oh, Lord. But what a life it has been. Honestly, I can't not, I was sitting there this morning, and I thought, wow, God, who am I? Who am I that the highest king? would look at me and say, this is your place. Come sit at the Jones table. Come sit at the Church for the City table. I can't, I can't thank him enough. I'm so grateful. I don't take any bit for granted. When we're out in trips, don't think that I'm over there, I'm going to go shopping. I, no, I'm loving the people. I'm grateful to the Lord for what I'm doing. I'm his helpmate. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to go right behind him and hug everybody. But you know, Finally, I had to step into my role, and, and I'm and thinking, you know what, I'm going to walk right beside him. I don't have, this is in India. I don't have to walk behind my husband. <laughs> I'm going to walk right beside him. And it was hard for me to take that role to think, like, I'm the mother of this house. Like, I can say it now because I truly love you guys. I, I for a long time, I, I sat there and I thought, I need to just be quiet. He, I wasn't here since 1993. I wasn't here when he started with six people. That wasn't me. I can't take the credit. I can't take the credit for the five kids, that, the extra kids that the Lord gave me. Happy Mother's Day to Lisa in, in Texas. Thank you for the five kids that we shared together. It is an honor to me. From day one when I married him, and he knows, I made a promise to God that I was going to love them and treat them like my own. And I have done that because I'm going to be true to to my father. And I, I'm just so happy that I get the honor. But what I was saying is that the, the Lord chose me, and it took me a while to say that. I kept thinking that I wasn't enough. I wasn't good enough. I'm not smart enough. He did all this on his own. I can't take the credit. And people come and like, Pastor Tyrone and his wife, thank you so much. Look what you've done. And I'm like sitting there. I don't want to stand up. And I, many times he's like, stand up. come." With. He's never, ever told me, sit down. You don't stand up. You weren't here from day one. He never, ever, he includes me in everything. This is my wife. And he, get up, get up with me. He, he gives me that honor. And I'm just so, so grateful. Because more importantly, the Lord gives me that honor. And it's an honor to walk in this life. Um, let's stand for the word. I'm going to read 2 Samuel chapter 9. The ladies that were here on, on Friday, 
I'm just going to catch everybody up a little bit from where uh, I don't want to leave anybody in Lodabar. Nobody needs to get stuck in chapter 4 of 2 Samuel. We're going to go to 2 Samuel 9. It's a little bit of a, a long chapter, but I'm going to read it. And you guys are going to be okay because a lot of pastors, including my husband, sometimes he'll say, I'm not going to make you stand up for the whole reading. Of, no, I am going to make you stand up for the whole time. <laughs> Because you know what? I've seen you all in concerts on social media. I've gone to concerts. I've gone to a Lakers game. And I stood up for a long time. So I know you guys can stand up for concerts. You can stand here for the word. Come on. And I'm sure your legs are not shaking like mine are right now. <laughs> You're going to be fine. Second Samuel 9 says, David asks, is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was a servant of Saul's family named Seba. They summoned him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Seba? I am your servant, he replied. So the king asked, Is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can show the kindness of God to? Seba said to the king, There is still Jonathan's son who was injured in both feet. The king asked him, Where is he? Seba answered the king, You'll find him in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar. Now there's a point I want to make about this. Siba, Siba, and maybe I'm not pronouncing it right, sorry, Siba. He was a family member of Saul who was Mephibosheth's grandfather. He knew where Mephibosheth was. He didn't stutter here. He knew exactly where he was. Isn't that awful? He's over there living at large at the palace. Knowing where his family member was. Don't we sometimes find ourselves that even our family members come to our rescue when we're stuck in the mud, stuck in a cave? Like I read this and I thought, wait, wait a minute. This dude, a relative of Mephibosheth, and, and he said he's crippled and he's, he knew exactly. I'd never gone. I, I want to say that he never went to look for him. Give him a piece of bread or something. Nothing. But that's a point I just wanted to make because of the, the story that I'm going to share with you guys. So King David had him brought from Lodabar. We're in verse 6. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell face down in deep respect. It's homage. The word is homage, and that's what it means, in deep respect and with honor. And David said, Mephibosheth. I am your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, since I intend to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all your grandfather Saul's fields, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth paid homage and said, what is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's att attendant Seba and said to him, I have given to your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and his family. You, your sons, and your servants are to work the ground for him. And you are to bring in the crops so your master's grandson will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, is always to eat at my table. Now Seba had 15 sons and 20 servants. 15 sons. Take that, Wongs. 15. <laughs> Look at him. I don't mean to pick on you. My mom had nine. She beat you. <laughs> Seba said to the king, your servant will do all my lord the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. I move out the way. I am nothing and no one without you. Holy Spirit, I give you this time that you can speak to my heart and the people's heart. That no one leaves this place untouched. That we all leave here free of our, of our anxieties, our depression, our insecurities, our traumas, Father God. We leave them here today. I pray that you speak to each one of us individually the way that only you can. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you pointed me out and searched me out. Oh, who am I? Who am I that the highest king would anoint me for a time such as this? I'm so grateful, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. You know, life has a way of pushing our dreams down. We make mistakes. We take detours many times. And you know, we get off course 
There's so many detours to take. Young, if young people that are here, there's always going to be detours to take. Like good, fun roads, they seem like, but they lead to nothing. They lead to, they lead to destruction. And I, I just pray that you guys learn after a detour to stop taking the detours and come back to the path. Come back. All the mothers that are here, I realize that some of us maybe were not good mothers. Maybe when our kids were growing up, we were a mess. Maybe we were in the deep of our destruction, our addictions. Maybe we were drunk through their whole childhood. Don't feel like you're here and getting condemned. The Lord's here to restore you. And now that you know the Lord, now that you've accepted Christ, now it's time that you show your, your children the change in you, that the Lord came and changed your life. And now you have an opportunity to share the love and do what you didn't do when they were growing up and say to them, hey, I was this, but now look at me now, I'm whole. And so I'm going to show that to you and to my grandkids now. So don't get stuck there. Dads, you, you, sometimes the man, this message is not just for moms. I want it. I think the Lord showed me just for the church in general. Like I said, I always struggled by thinking that I was the mother of the house. But, but I own it now. I know that the Lord called me for that. So I'm just speaking because I love you all. And the Lord told me that there's so many people here that carry their insecurities and their traumas just like I did. I carried them for a long time. I'm very insecure. And I, even, even our, our, ourselves, I think as women, we put ourselves down. Stop staring at social media and Instagram and all the pictures of families all lovey-dovey and everybody's always having fun. It ain't like that. It's not like that. It's just for pictures. I always look at people and I'm like, God, that person is so photogenic. I wish I was photogenic. I'm sorry for the people that take pictures because you guys probably search everywhere for a good picture of me. I know that. I, I, you know, my, I, one eye is smaller than the other. Like, I will play, pick up. My son's a photographer. He, one time he told me, you're the hardest person to, pitch, to take a picture of. <laughs> but I always come up with one, one eye closed. My face is so round. I'm like, I wish I could do the kissy face every time in camera. Horrible. I can pick out my flaws so easily. But I'm sure that you guys do too. Listen, I told the women on Friday, like, I went to go get a facial. And it... I, why do I do this? Like I sat there and I'm picking out my own flaws. I'm like, you're going to have to use more product because my face is so round. And she was just like, okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yesterday I went into my sister's shop and she gave me an, um, a compliment. And I told her, no, I didn't lose any weight. I've gained like eight pounds since I got back from Greece. I could have just shut up and said thank you. And be like, oh, yeah, she, she loves me. She sees me a little bit lighter. But I always pick out my flaws. And don't we all? Not only that, but we see ourselves in the mirror. And you got to remember that when the Lord sees us, he sees his image. Because we were created in his image. But we're so quick to point things out. We're so quick to point out all the faults and the things that, we, that our husband has. And that we have, and I haven't gotten this far because my uncle abused me and my mother didn't believe me when I told her. Or maybe my own parents abused me. Maybe the neighbor, maybe, and nobody listened. And we carry that. We carry that with us. We carry it into adulthood. We carry it into the church. We carry it on to our, and start having children. And we're all messed up inside because we haven't let that go. We haven't forgiven ourselves. We need to stop looking at the person that dropped us and start looking at the one who told us to get up. And my message today is called get up. There's a seat at the table for you. The king is looking for you. Every injustice done to you. He saw every mistake I was going to make. God is not in the condemning business. He's in the restoration business. I was dropped like Mephibosheth. I married a young man from our church youth group. And I thought that marriage was going to be forever. That's what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be like my parents' marriage. And the first time that I got hit, I was, didn't know what to, how to react or what to do. Is this actually happening? Like this is the man that was supposed to love me and protect me that I saved myself for, 
What is happening? Where are you, Jesus? Where are you? I would go into my secret place. My kids were little. I would turn on the shower and cry in there and ask Jesus, where are you? Where were you last night? Where were you last night when I was getting beat up? Where were you? How come I didn't feel you? Why didn't you strike this man down? <laughs> you know, there's so many things that I would tell the Lord, do you not see? And I would ask the Lord, to, can I leave this marriage? Can I leave? I would beg him not to leave with the other women that he had. And I, I would get up and say, tell the Lord tomorrow morning, I want to wake up and I want you to give me the okay. Like, just write it on the wall. But yet that's okay for you to leave. You can leave this marriage. But imagine if I did wake up and it was on the wall. I probably would have ran out the house. Why in the world? Who wrote on the wall? You know, sometimes we ask the Lord for something and then he gives it to you and you're freaked out. Like, like the day that he healed me from the book. I mean, I'm crying at the table. I'm like, <laughs> good, searching for it. I was going crazy looking for the bump. Like, he answers your prayer. You're still there like in unbelief. So in awe of God. He wants to put us back on the right path. He wanted to put me back on the right path. I was chosen from my mother's womb. The Bible tells me that I was wonderfully made. And I need to just tell you people, just tell yourself in the mirror. Tell yourself that every day. Just believe the voice of God. Get into scripture. I was telling the first service this morning that my husband, he, he says it from, from up here. He tells all of us, if you're not a scripture person, start with reading Proverbs 1 on May 1st, or on the first day of the month, and then so forth. My mom would tell us the same thing. And that's one other thing. I remember when he said that the first time I was like, mom, did you hear that? This is it, this dude. Not only was he a Pepsi delivering guy, hallelujah, that's my, that's my drink of choice. I was like, I'm so with you. I'm so with you. I forgot all about that he was a human criminal. Nothing mattered when I found out he was a Pepsi guy. <laughs> Nothing else mattered. Yeah, we're Cobra Kings. No, no, no. Come on. <laughs> it's okay, baby. You're okay. You, you, you grew up to be okay. <laughs> you never were in school long enough anyway, so. <laughs> Mephibosheth was the grandson. I will probably not get the mic for two more years, so I'm just going to let loose right now. <laughs> Mephibosheth was the grandson of King Saul. And as you all know, King Saul was the first king of Israel. Not a good king. The people of Israel suffered a lot. And I believe that King Saul had lots of insecurities. First of all, everybody loved David. I mean, David could play the harp. He would go and play. I was telling the ladies on Friday, I forgot this, I didn't tell you. I was like, wouldn't it be so cool? Like if pastor's all stressed and going nuts and we have so much going on. I was like, hey guys, can you guys come play over here? Just play, feed us some grapes. <laughs> somebody to fan me over here with my, uh, right now that I'm going to, through menopause, it'd be lovely if somebody fanned me. But I imagine the palace that way, you know. But so King David would go, or David, he wasn't king then, but he would play for King Saul. And so that's how David and Jonathan, Jonathan, father of, I mean, son of King Saul, they became best friends. So they made a pact. They were very good friends. And so when King Saul and Jonathan were killed in the battle, the word came to the palace that they were coming to the palace to kill everybody else. Now, I always wondered, I don't know if you, if you read a scripture and you're like, I wonder what. I wondered, I was like, well, why did the nanny feel she had to run? But if you read the history back in that day, once a new king took over, he had to kill everybody that would challenge the throne. Mephibosheth was, was in line to the throne. He was in line to go through the throne. So he was going to be killed. So the nanny picked him up with all good intentions and she runs. She runs. I don't know. I want to imagine she was running through the forest, running through the palace. I don't know. It doesn't say exactly where she fell. Maybe she wasn't even out of the palace yet. But he fell so hard that he became crippled in an instant. How many of us have had our innocence robbed in an instant? 
in an instant, he lost. He was no longer going to go to the throne. He was royalty, but no longer would he become king. And not only that, but he was crippled. Crippled for life. Lame. The Bible says lame. How many of us walk around lame? We, we, we walk around with a crutch of, oh, my dad left us when we were really little. Or my mom left us. Or my mom was drunk all the time. Or my dad, you know, beat us all up. And you're walking around and you're carrying that into your lives, into your marriages. We walk around with a crutch. It's so easy. It's just as easy as, like, you run around, oh, I'm, I, I have anxiety. I've always suffered from it. So that's why I use pot because it calms me down. Or that's why I resort to alcohol because it just helps me to deal with stuff. But where, where's the word of God? Where do you leave it? Instead of picking up the bottle or the pot, pick up the word of God. Go for a run. Go walk. Call your friend, call somebody, for your CLG leader, hey, I'm really struggling today. And I'm not saying that I don't believe in these things. I believe that, that Satan does place anxiety, depression, all of these things that we carry. You know what? Satan knows what we were created to be, what we're supposed to be. He was a worship leader. He knew full well, but he wants to stop us. He, right now when the world is going so crazy and all the people are out there telling you what they believe in, what we should do, all these protesters. And where are we? Are we hiding in the church? Go out there and pick up your sign too. And Jesus loves you. You don't have to go do it the way they do. But just our, our mannerisms and the way that we walk, the way that we talk, we've got to do it. Men, you've got to stand up. You got to stand up for your household. It's time that, I know it's not Father's Day, but it's time that you become the priest of your household. The Lord's going to hold you accountable. No more Adams. No more Adams. There's a lot of women. I know that we're tough. Listen, I lived by myself with three kids, and I had three jobs to make it. My son, Eli's here. He's not going to let, let me lie. We struggled. It was tough. But I know that women can do it. I know we have it in us. But the Lord put you guys in charge of us. So you need to lift your women up. Don't, don't be a wuss. I think Adam, I'm just going to talk it. This second service, I'm just going to say it. M women, we're tough. And some of us say like, oh, I, I love that my husband, you know, he just listens to me. And he lets me do what I want. I can go spend. He doesn't even know what's in there. Stop. It's not your job. Stop it. You need to honor and respect your husband and let him lead. Encourage him to lead. Nobody secretly in our secret place, come on women, secretly in our hearts, we don't want a wuss to lead us. Heck no. We want a manly man. If there's something about this man right here, and I can say it without a shadow of doubt, without lying. I don't tell this man what to do. Sometimes I would want to. <laughs> Give me some more tacos. <laughs> Bless his heart. Sometimes he's counting how much I've had. I'm like, if we're at a restaurant, I get my, my Escobar comes in me. I'm like, I'll pay for them if you think I'm having too many. I get all crazy. <laughs> Don't come between me and the food. Um, but man, honestly, Adam, I th really think that he ate the fruit First of all, Eve, come on, girl. I, I have a love-hate relationship with her. I told you guys this Friday. I want to go to heaven and after I meet Jesus, <laughs> this is horrible to say, but I'm going to be like, Eve, I'll meet you in the corner of Gold Avenue and Ruby Street. <laughs> I got a few words. I want to ask you, how good was the fruit anyway? ¿Qué era? ¿Durazno? ¿Manzana o qué? Was it even ripe? Was it worth it? Still, girl, cut. Talking to a snake? That's a whole nother sermon. But why did she think that was cute? Out of all the animals, the snake is walking up like this. Because they didn't, by, at that time, they were still standing upright. Why, is, why did she befriend a snake? What in the world? And then she goes, gives the fruit to Adam. And Adam, oh, Dios mío. Oh, he's like, okay, baby. And he eats it. Stop, man. I think Adam 
ate the fruit, not only because he was the worst, but he didn't want Eve to go sleep on the other side of the garden. If he said no, she was probably like, fine, I'm going to take my leaves and go over here on this side, you know? And men, I have actually heard men say that, oh, it's just easier to give her away, to let her take control. It's just easier. Really, stop being lazy. You're the man of the household. Carry your household. If your son is in trouble, if, you're, if your daughter is going the wrong direction, if she's dating the wrong man, if your son is going to the, seeing things that they shouldn't see on the Internet and all of these things that they're doing. Listen, I've heard video games. They're over there cussing and they're playing cards and our kids are listening to stuff that is so crazy. And then you come to the church and you worry because pastor talks about sex. or Your kids are hearing worse at home in those games. Stand up. Be the man and say no more. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Take your place. Take your place in the home. We would be a much better church. Our families would be much better if you just lay down your insecurities and your traumas and just do what the Lord intended for you to do. <laughs> Carry your household. Get up and pray. Break out that oil. If you don't have any? We have some right here. We'll give you one to take. Go. I did it. I did it for my son. I've done it for my daughter-in-law. I'm going to pray in the household, walk around the household, pray for their shoes, pray for their pillow. Pray, pray, pray. Instead of going and crying to other women, oh, mi esposo, my husband, oh, my wife, no la aguanto. <laughs> this wife of mine. And then, we, and then we blame the Lord like, you gave me this wife. What? Dude, you chose her. Start praying for her. You start praying for your husband. Pray for each other. Just pray, pray. Shut your mouth and stop talking back. Just my mom used to say, que sea un loco no dos. Let it be one crazy person and not two. If one starts going crazy, I'm like, hey, let me take a turn, baby. It's my turn to go crazy today. <laughs> let me take a turn right now. But let's carry each other. If your wife comes to you and says, you know, I really miss partying. And you're like, oh, okay, mija. Because if we go party, then we come home and we can, you know. She'll be happy that we went out. There'll be nuki time. <laughs> no? There'll be nuki time if you take your place because we'll want it. It's so easy. So easy. We're easy. All we need is love and tender care. I'm sorry for the young kids, but it's, this is real. It's easy. If all day long you send us a text now and then, this man texts me, hey, I'm going to Starbucks. Hey, well, this is the fifth time, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking home from the church. Do you know what that means to me, especially coming from the relationship that I came from? Sometimes I'm like, you don't have, I'm thinking in my head, you don't have to tell me. But it means so much to me that he takes the time. I'm on my way to eat breakfast with Barry. And I'm like, where's my breakfast? Bring me some. <laughs> Barry, come on, you got to watch out for me. You, it means so much to me that he does that. Mephibosheth became lame in both his feet. We all have some stuff that holds us back, takes us back, but no more excuses. It's so easy to make excuses. When I first married pastor, I would make an excuse like, don't tell me to pray or anything because, you know, I'm thinking in Spanish. And then I have to translate porque pienso en español. I grew up reading the word in Spanish. I grew up praying in Spanish. And so now I make it a point. Can I get on my knees? Okay, I'm going to speak in English so that my words can get better. I'm going to read the word in English so that it can stick to me. And maybe one of these days I can pronounce the words better. But there's so many excuses. I wasn't here since day one. How could I take the credit? Or it just different things. It's, sometimes it's really dumb things that stop us from, from, if I would have been raised better, some of us say, don't we? If my parents hadn't died when I was little. If my, if my, if my husband hadn't had so many affairs. If my uncle hadn't came into my room that night. If my mom would have believed me when I told her what was happening. We just have so many excuses that stop, stop us from getting to where we're supposed to be. 
We are so needed. Moms, we're so needed for our, even if your kids are growing up, they still need us. They still need us to show the way. We still have a voice. There's other young ladies here that come without their mothers, and we need to be mothers. We need to be an example. Leave all of that behind. How long have you been carrying your, your traumas and your insecurities? How long have you been carrying them? Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of carrying them? I was so tired of carrying all of that and saying that maybe I deserve this or I deserve that because I, I didn't go to the Lord and ask him if this was the man for me. So it was hard for me to, to get up from where I was. Mephibosheth was stuck in Lodabar. And Lodabar, is that, am I pronouncing that right? Lodabar was a place, a desolate place, the Bible says. Nothing grew there. No green pasture. It was the slums. The ghetto, if you want to say. But it was just a place where nobody went. So I, the Bible says that one day there was a buzz in the town and everybody was talking and, get, you know, people were like coming out of their houses. No cell phones then, but let me tell you that gossip spread there too, just like it does today. And they were talking about the royal soldiers coming in. Y todo mundo emocionado. Everybody was so excited because the soldiers were coming. There's something that I love about when I went to London and going to the palace and seeing just royalty and the changing of the guards is so cool. And I thought about that when I read this passage. I bet the people were like that, but not Mephibosheth. He was so afraid. He was so scared. The king has found me and he's going to come to kill me. That's his, that was his first thought. I've been found. The soldiers come in, and, and he's just stuck there for years. He was five years old. And if I followed the verses correctly, it, it was like 20 years later. And he was still in Lodabar. Royalty. He was royalty. There's royalty running through his hands. He's royalty. Don't forget when we're stuck in the mud, when we're stuck in all our mess, and we, oh, people are going to know at church. If I go to church, they're going to know what I did yesterday or the, the week before. But you are still a daughter and a son of God, and he's not here to condemn you. You are royalty. Your circumstance doesn't change you. It doesn't change who you are. I love the story of my husband. He didn't grow up with his father, didn't even know his father till he was in his 20s. And when I go hear now the stories of his stepbrothers that did grow up with his dad, they said he's the one that looks most like him. Even his mannerisms. And I saw pictures and I was like, wow, how could he learn his dad's mannerisms when he didn't even grow up with him? Well, he had Jones in his blood. He's a Jones, grew up a Jones. We are kings. We are born out of the king. The king is our father. He's our king. We're royalty. Even in our mess, it doesn't change my name. It doesn't change who I am. Circumstances will not change me. I may be in Lodabar, but Lodabar doesn't have to be in me. We, you need to get up. Take your place. Get up. Get up. He wants to take you out. Take you out of that mess. Believe in who the Lord says you are. you got to get up. You got to get up. You got to leave all that behind. You know why? Because we have children coming up behind us and they're watching us. They're following us. That's the one thing that made me say, you know what? I leave this behind because I don't want my daughter to one day accept this. I don't want my sons to one day feel like it's okay. If, if, if Laura or Natalie or Karina or Kathy, they cook the meal wrong and it's too salty or not enough salt, that, oh, it's okay for them to hit me or throw the food at the wall because that's what I grew up seeing. No, I was like, I'm going to break that. I'm going to break that. And I'm going to open the way, clear the way for them. And I pray that no divorce in my family. That's one big thing that's always been having on my heart. I don't want any, I never wanted to be divorced. Pastor had never wanted to be a divorce. But here we are. It's not your first choice. Do not, it's so easy nowadays to go to the courthouse and, oh, well, it didn't work out. She doesn't even know how to cook. Or this dude, he's never given me a compliment. You know, well, let's just, just get divorced. Let's try it again. Nope. It's not the way out. You got to stay. You got to stay and pray. You got to wait on the Lord. We try to hide from God because we feel he's always going to condemn us. But God is looking for us to restore us, to make us whole, to heal us.
to give you all that belongs to you. The joy, the peace, the honor, the freedom, the victory. Pay you back for all the unfair things that happened to you. I believe that the king went after Mephibosheth, not because he had made a pact with Jonathan, but I really truly believe that the Holy Spirit just whispered in his ear, you know, in the king's ear and said, go find Mephibosheth. He was propped, but it's ready. I'm ready for him to come home. He needs to sit at the table and eat with me. There's a place at the table for all of us. We can sit at the king's table. Why are you still broken? Why are you limping? Why are you still struggling in that area? The psalmist says, God heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. Jesus said he came to set us free. When you have been bruised by life, when you are hurt, it's so easy to get stuck in Lodabar. But please, today, I'm telling you, he's pursuing you. Stop. Let him reach you. Let him pick you up. And listen, isn't this a great story? This story at the end. Like his enemy, the one that pursued Saul, the one that pursued Saul, he then comes and tells him, come sit at my table. His enemy, his enemy, that's what's going to happen to our enemies. They're going to they're gonna know we're children of God. He's going to give you new friendships. If your friend stabbed you in the back and you feel like, oh, I can't have any more friends because I'm so afraid to get her. Stop. Well, then pray for new friendships, for new joy. Don't be afraid to love your pastor and the pastor's wife. Just because you've been hurt at a different church. Maybe you came here. But be restored in Jesus' name. Be restored. Let's worship together. Let's expand the kingdom together. I'm ready. I love the church. I love all of you. I join with my husband in believing that we can expand the kingdom. And when the Lord comes, he finds his bride ready. Ready and free of all our traumas. Just free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Free indeed. So stop looking at the one that dropped you. This is my last words. Stand up. Stop looking at he who dropped you and look at the one that's picking you up. Look at the one that's extending his hand. Don't look to the back or to the side. Remember Lot's wife. What became of her? You want to be a big pillar of salt? Don't look behind you. Don't look to the sides. Don't take detours. Look ahead to the Father, the one, the only, the King of kings who make us whole, who restores us. He did it for me. He sat me here at this table. And I'm forever grateful. My mom used to say this, get up every morning and be grateful. He died on the cross for you. Just be grateful. Everything else will fall into place. Get in the word. Get in the word. Get in the word. Get in the word. And he'll show you how to guide. How to guide your, your family and your children in Jesus' name. Father, I'm so grateful. If there's somebody here in this house, everybody hands lifted up. It's a sign of surrender. It's a sign of I can't do it alone and I don't want to do it alone anymore, Father. Pick me up out of this cave. Take me out of Lodabar. I don't want to be stuck in this place. I don't want to be stuck in anxiety and depression and all these insecurities. I want to lead well. I want to take my family to greener pastures. Oh, Father, I pray that you speak to everybody's heart this morning. That if somebody is here that hasn't given their life to Jesus, that you prompt them today. That they can know that they can walk out of here free. That we can walk out of here so much lighter. It is such a wonderful thing. It's such a wonderful thing. Even the trees are greener. And everything around you is so much prettier. Where we're walking in our freedom. So Father God, Father God, do it for everybody here like you did today. We're ready to be seated at the table. We're ready to be seated at the table. Thank you for making room for us. I pray for this church. I pray for all of us, Father. I pray for every man to stand up and be the priest of their household. I pray for every woman to be a Proverbs 31 woman. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. No other name like Jesus. No other name like Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Have a wonderful day. I love you, church.